He was very kind in the beginning. And he gave me everything I wanted. Like, he gave me a company. He gave me tools. He let me teach. He let me do everything I loved. This is the world the way I want it, and this is the world the way it is. If these line up, remember what we call them? Like, so I have someone who is in the external world, it would look like telling me something I already know. I can, I can. I meant the 2009, this is key, after his meeting. Um, in the future, it might be good if I'm speaking, let me speak. I'm sorry. And then, no, no, and then say that afterwards. Um, in any situation, you can learn. I was terrified of Keith. Whenever I was in a meeting with other people, he acted like I wasn't there. He would correct me whenever I said anything. He purposely disempowered me. So when he was around, I never opened my mouth. You know, when, when Nancy Salzman said that, that Keith Ranieri was abusive, she began to come to that understanding. And that's kind of what I was trying to tell her, not kind of, that's what I was telling her in um, January 2016, is I began to notice the way he treated her. And I was telling her that, but she couldn't actually take it in, um, which I think is pretty common when you adore somebody that much, you can't actually see what's going on in front of you. Because I do think that subconsciously she was feeling a lot of stuff that she just wasn't allowed to feel, which is pretty common when people are being abused. And if you, if you listen to my podcast, Letter to the Inside, um, that's when I address with her um, the way she shut down when he was around. And I said something about the, to the effect of that it was because she had to do it in order to not face the horror of what was actually going on. Dear Nancy, I've told you before, I believe you have been treated with great cruelty. You couldn't even take it in. Perhaps because you yourself have come to believe if you acknowledge abuse, you may be demonized as the abuser and further punished. Well, let me say it on your behalf. I believe you have been abused in ways you cannot even allow yourself to imagine. You are in a permanent state of terror. Do you know why you fall asleep in every single meeting with your Lord and Master? It's not because you're disintegrated. I think it's because you're trying to unconsciously check out from the horror. What was the terrible breach slash sin you believe you've committed that makes you terrified for your salvation? I just thought you deserved to know who is pulling the strings behind the curtain, not me. I'm one of the few that actually try to help you see the trap you're in. So in the early days, I was totally honest with Keith. So he learned a lot about my depression. I told him about my relationship problems and Keith instructed me not to get into another relationship until I worked my dependency issues. Then he became very affectionate toward me and made sexual advances. He abruptly ended our physical relationship and he asked me to commit to never beginning another relationship with anyone or getting involved with another man without discussing it with him first. He had all of these relationships, but he didn't with me. And it wasn't that I wanted to, have a relationship with him, but it always was like, why did he do that to me? And I always felt ashamed of it, but it felt worse when he started having sex with my daughter. Yeah. Mom doesn't mind you sleeping with me. <laughs> I don't know, that's me true. It was, I had mixed feelings. I felt like it, in a way it was a betrayal but I also felt like that maybe it was wrong to feel that way. Like, I mean, he's, he was supposed to be this very ethical person and she wasn't a child, but she was. After college, she moved back in with me and Keith wanted her to move out. And he said I was keeping her dependent. It was really bad. He convinced her to move out. And she said immediately he was on her. And she said he just wanted to get me away from you so he could do that. 
she was destroyed by it and it and it it's 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 fucking terrible it's like oh my god why didn't why didn't we just see how bad it really was there was always like well he must know better he must know what he's doing he's keith I remember having a conversation with him when I was 18 and he wanted me to commit to something, some sort of something kind of relationship with him that I didn't know that I was agreeing to or understood what it was that he was asking. At some point it became a breach. I broke some sort of commitment to him and then my relationship with, with him was broken forever and I was always supposed to repair it. And you came after me for 20 years. I have to repair this, this relationship with Keith. And if I don't, I don't know what. He never liked Michelle. But I didn't realize it was because she wouldn't have sex with him. So, I guess I should have. He stole her childbearing years. practically broke her. I mean, she went to college, but she was a baby when she met him. She was not worldly. And she was not strong. Not like me. He really affected my family badly. And I let that happen. I couldn't see it. I think it was like an experiment with him. I started thinking that he enjoyed hurting us. He just wanted to see how far he could push us. Like, how much could he get away with? Most mornings he would come over and I would make him breakfast. He came to my house on this particular morning and he said, I need you to do something. And I said, what? And he said, Pam had an accident. Would you change the bed? Pam was wasting away. You know what people look like when they're dying of cancer. It was very clear she was dying. And I said, of course. I mean, I'm a nurse. And I started asking questions. He said, you don't have to go right now. It's okay. And I said, well, she's in, if she's in a wet bed, let me go change it. I don't want her to get a bed sore. She can't get out of bed. And he said, she's fine. Make me breakfast. So I made him breakfast. And then... As he was eating, I said, why don't I go now? No, he said, you can sit and talk with me. So I thought it wasn't like an urgent thing. I get there, and she had defecated all over herself. And he let her stay in that while he ate breakfast in my house. I felt so upset that he would let her stay that way. It wasn't the same after that with me, with him. Doesn't care about any of us. It was very clear to me. This bottle is very valuable to me right now because I'm thirsty and there's water in it. But when I'm not thirsty, I can just put it down and walk away. That's how Keith treated us. People are utilities to Keith. That's it. That is a shocking moment for her. And that's a demonstration of who he really is. And I think that's, that is maybe the beginning of the end for her. That's one of the seeds. She uses the bottle metaphor, you know. She talks about how she needs the bottle and then doesn't need the bottle. And this is the metaphor of how he sees the world. And 
That is very accurate. Honestly, one of the most accurate statements I've ever heard her say. Because that is how he sees people as objects. And I think in this moment, Nancy is coming finally to the realization of what I had been trying to say uh, for a long time of like, oh, we're just pawns. We're just objects. We're like nothing. When Keith left the country, I started waking up in the morning feeling peaceful. And I would think to myself, what is wrong with you? You have this wonderful life that he helped you create. Like, what is wrong with you? Had any support at all? No, nothing, no professional support. What's your perception right now of what you went through? Um, Keith was, well, in the beginning he was kind, but he got more and more and more controlling as time went on. But I, I don't think I ever thought about leaving. I, he, I just thought he was difficult. I think it's important for people to, when they look back and deconstruct their, this experience, if you can think of like your life in three identities, there's the identity before, where there was something lacking in your life. So then identity number two, is you get almost intoxicated with this feeling like I found this great thing and you get the whole camaraderie and the community and all of that and it feels really good. And then when that world crumbles like it has for you, who am I now? But you can get there by looking at your first identity and try to get at why were you vulnerable to these kinds of control tactics? He got me into a, you know, like a reenactment of trying to get approval from my mother. I was always wanting to do things that would make her feel happy with me. And I grew up and I just accommodated everybody because I wanted approval. Keep your yeah. walk yeah. and talk to yeah. you. My and I believe that Keith knew that I always needed approval and therefore he always withheld approval. And the more he withheld approval, the harder I worked. In a bit. Oh, you want me in Italy? Yeah. Uh -huh. but, but just not moving forward. Point you didn't work okay, I'll take this. If I didn't behave in the way he wanted me to behave, he would tell me I was breaching my ethics and that I wasn't strong. I think that's how Keith got me to do everything that he got me to do. He constantly made me feel like nothing I did was good enough. He constantly was trying to get Nancy to feel responsible for any mistake she made. This is the piece that I really hope that you can articulate how psychological manipulation is self-perpetuating. You were used for the things you were good at and for how he could control you. It's going to take you some time to heal. Highlight the aha moments, the times when you may feel guilty because you could have stepped in or you promoted things that hurt others. Everything is so blurred because we trusted that he was teaching us something that we didn't know about being ethical and living an ethical life. And so we committed ourselves to something that we thought was real and principled. And we did things for him because he convinced us that that's what we were doing. I remember this one particular time, I saw him do something that I was very upset about with a woman. And I found it completely inappropriate. And I told her. 
And he said to me, you have no right to think you know what what I'm doing means. You have no way of understanding the way that I work with people. And you have no right to question how I work with women. If you ever do it again, ever, you will never see me again. We will never speak again. And I was horrified, horrified. I, I didn't know what to do. And I somehow made myself wrong. Looking back, I was constantly doing damage control about Keith's sex life. It was so hard. I never wanted to do that. Is it bad? Yes. But you weigh it against all these people are having a great experience and it's just his little world. I used my authority to edify Keith Ranieri, and he took the credibility that I gave him, and he abused many people. And I don't know how to live with that. And that's my cross to bear in my life. He kept sending me in. I felt so lost and and I had no one to talk to and I don't know if I did good things or bad things I didn't know anymore because I I couldn't tell I didn't know I didn't know what was right and wrong anymore because he kept saying I'm gonna die if you don't if you don't do this you don't understand how this affects my health you have to go do this and I would just keep going in and going in and going in but that's why I participated. I was trying to put it back together all the time. I was trying to make up for what he was doing. I don't know. I just, I don't know. But I guess that's, that's at the root of the whole thing. I feel so guilty because I couldn't do better. <laughs> I don't know. These people are going to come to my sentencing and maybe I should go to jail because I, this is what I did. Maybe it's, you know, for three years I have to sit and be in jail to, to make up for the, 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 the damage that I did by, by, by empowering him.